afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Ara McCauley. I'm the di artistic director of the festival, and I'm very pleased to present Brief Interludes, Stories of Music. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the festival customarily takes place and where I am situated this afternoon is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this lands, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who'd come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I'd like to thank the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council for their ongoing support of the festival. We are grateful to those organizations and individuals who support us. Um, and for this event, I'd like to specifically thank Maureen Ball and Tom Williams, author patrons for Mark Anthony Jarman. This event is an hour long and includes a question and answer period. Feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen at any point for the moderator. There is also a raise your hand function located in the bottom row, depending on your device. So you can click that to raise your hand if uh, you'd like to and we can unmute you when it's your turn to ask your question. As a thank you to you for continuing to support Kingston Writers Fest and joining us for the virtual edition of the festival, we are randomly selecting a pre-registered participant of each event to win a copy of the author's book. Um, now I am delighted to introduce this event's interviewer, Adrian Michael Kelly. Adrian is the author of the novel Down Sterling Road and the short fiction collection The Ambassador of What. His work has appeared in publications such as Best Canadian Stories, The Journey Prize Anthology, The Queen's Quarterly, and The Globe and Mail. Canadian Notes and Queries describes his writing as a brand new mode of storytelling. It rearticulates your way of seeing the world, reprograms your brain, gets your feet tapping to a different beat. Born in Timmins, Adrian has enjoyed stints in South Korea, Switzerland, and Italy, and now calls Kingston home. Please welcome Adrian Michael Kelly. Ara, thank you very much. Uh, and I have to say that I'm especially grateful to Ara and to everyone at Kingston Writers Fest for asking me to host this particular session this year. Not often do I get the chance to sit down and yak with a living can-lit legend do I overstate the case? No, not at all. Mark Anthony Jarman is one of those writers. I mean a writer about whom other writers talk a lot, often enviously, always admiringly. Recently, in preparation for this interview, I undertook an enjoyable survey. Almost every Canadian writer I know, and I know a lot of them, can remember the very first time they read a Mark Anthony Jarman story. We advocate, we Jarmanites, on behalf of our favorite tales, whether it's Cowboys Incorporated from Mark's debut collection, Dancing Nightly in the Tavern, or Burn Man on Texas Porch from 19 Knives, which was published back in 2000. And that's hard to believe because I reread it recently and it still feels hot off the press, hot off the pen, ready as ever to sear its way into readerly memory. Check techno. Jarman's latest will no doubt keep the friendly arguments amongst writers and readers going. Subtitled stories of music, it could of course be called stories in music. More than any other writer I know of, including Gary Lutz, Gordon Lish, and William H. Gass, Mark Jarman plays the page and he plays it in singular fashion like a radically improvisational jazz pianist but cross that jazz pianist with some cheating and hurting tunes, some rhythm and blues and honky tonk, maybe some old time Dylan, and while we're at it, some serious Sturm and Drang. Jarman's sentences and paragraphs beg to be read aloud. Plot, sure, he can do that when and if he wants, but in his narrator's monologues, in their reveries and confessional fantasia, Jarman renders, it seems to me, the very motions of consciousness. On every page of a Jarman book, you'll find small miracles of perception and your own perceptions challenged, if not changed. 
We all get a chance to listen in now as Mark reads from the fifth and final story in Czech Techno, Nowhere Man's Second Day at the Ruins. Mark, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was saying this on Thursday too. I never know what to do during the intro. I think, you know, should I look humble? Should I look happy? <laughs> Anyways, that was, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. I don't hear that very often. So it's nice to once in a while get something like that. My genuine pleasure, Mark. You go right ahead. Okay. So I'll start with the reading. Is that the, okay. Yeah, this is, um, this is from the last piece in uh, the book because he showed a Czech techno and it's uh, it did a really great job. It almost feels like a graphic novel. It's, it's got a feel and a look and, and each story has got an illustration with it, which is really fun to do. And, and it's the same person, Chris Tompkins, who did the cover of my book, Knife Party at the Hotel Europa. So they almost match. They're kind of red and black and kind of companions. So this is a, a pretty short piece. It'll only be a few minutes. Um, it's set in uh, Pompeii and then moves on to Rome. And uh, I don't think I really need to set it up too much. Um, so I'll just begin. Our second day at the ruins. In this heat, a Jack Russell gallops after pigeons in the broken stones of Pompeii's grand palace. How does the panting dog find water in this heat and dust? Ray Ray says again that he's leaving the band. We'd be in trouble without a singer. The Ray Ray threatens this every day. Naples at night, I can still conjure the scent of crazy Vespas and garbage and brillantine pickpockets. At dawn, we pull ourselves from a mattress for another woozy train to sunbright ruins, to climb a 13th century alley of cobbles and dodge speed, speeding scooters in a lane narrower than a closet, and wolf down pizza that is almost liquid and the best pasta ever. What devilish alchemy makes their food so delicious? The train station where I last saw the Texan woman makes me feel like a loser. Her promise to meet me, her name somehow in all these stirring names, Pompeii, Herculaneum, Sorrento, Amalfi, Positano, Napoli. And soon, soon we'll be back in the bosom of peach colored Rome. We climb onto the last train and down the aisle. I take a seat on the right. Ray Ray takes a seat on the left side of the aisle. Ray Ray tells me, I'm the second son of a second wife, so my status in Nigeria is lower than my older brother. Ray Ray takes my wrist and says, I bet you five euro no one will sit by me. I've gotten to know Ray Ray on the road. He chases Croatian chambermaids as a bit of a con man, but really, he's a cream puff. At a party, he worried I hadn't eaten and deftly cooked me seafood and rice on a tiny skillet. But Ray Ray is so tall and so dark, the Italians fear him. So will you take my bet, Ray Ray asked me, five euro. Why not? Someone will sit by him. What does he mean? The train from Napoli to Rome fills up and seats around us fill up. The feeling of pure will as the train hums and shunts from the station and I lose my five euro bet to a new form of Jim Crow. Every seat occupied except for three blue seats around Ray Ray. Avenues in Rome seem so familiar, so pleasing after Napoli's volcanic dust and volcanic drugs and mountains of stinking trash and that sharp knife in Napoli steering its way through the air of a kitchen party. Like athletes, we fled from that knife. Napoli is compelling, spookier than Rome. But Rome now seems a kind of a home, a comforting feeling since I've lost my way, lost my home back home. In Rome, I check email spam. Hello, beloved, I am Mrs. Stella Ethan, a Christian. God has directed me to pick you for an inheritance. Everything is available. How I love that last phrase, it's slight truth. Well, Mrs. Stella Ethan, I'll tell you. I wish to drive a Hupmobile, a Nash Metropolitan, a whisper slide ride past the riding stable to park at my home by the well-behaved seaside. Hi, honey. And Mrs. Stella Ethan, please note that Moorish window across the street, a modest but beautiful place. My desire is for you to buy me that whitewashed building. I'll turn it into an art deco cinema and a blind pig, an illegal bar with rounds on the house when the Pope drops by and our band will open for Amy Winehouse alive and smiling on that tiny stage in the corner. 
In this lovely foundling world, all thirsty dogs shall have water. Machines will pour out euros and Mr. Jim Crow be gone forever. All of us happy in the blue seats, bad tattoos removed, our teeth restored, riding in a heaven beside peasants and messiahs. This is Stella Ethan, the Christian calls from my spam folder. Have confidence, accept my proposal in good faith, Stella says. Everything is available, she says. And why would we doubt her heartwarming, heartwarming words? Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much for that, Mark. Sorry for my throat clearing here and my allergies are acting up a little bit today. Um, that, uh, that excerpt that you just read, I thought, calls for just a, a brief encore. So if everyone will bear with me for a minute, especially you, Mark, as I read to you a brief excerpt of your own prose from the very same story, Nowhere Man's Second Day at the Ruins. Um, just a little bit of background for our readers. The narrator uh, is the, uh, the, bass, the bass player in a band, and they're obviously on tour uh, in Europe. And at one point, they're in Napoli. Um, a city with which I'm familiar, so maybe that's why I was drawn to this uh, to this passage. And the narrator is sort of offering his thoughts um, as to why it is we choose to live in cities <clears throat> as opposed to the countryside, not least the Italian countryside, um, which is uh, fantastically beautiful. But just a brief paragraph with a follow-up question about this paragraph and other paragraphs that you've written too. I suppose it is the same everywhere. We don't want Laban's Rom. We don't care for the apple orchard by the stream. We gravitate to cement cities, born there or moving there. We follow our bliss, follow our stairwell rats and staple guns and opiates, love to hang out at the curb or line up for bonehead jobs and pick each other's pocket and live without leafy trees or pink blossoms our desire to avoid God and nature, to take groaning elevators to boxes set atop boxes, our desire to stand on each other's head to the soundtrack of machines and synths. So my question for you, Mark, um, and I really wanna know the answer to this personally, and I'm sure um, some readers will, or audience members today will be interested too. Typically, how long would it take you to write a paragraph such as that and relatedly, um, to what extent is your writing propelled less by, you know, a conventional narrative thrust or plot, for instance, than it is by sound and rhythm? Yeah, I would go with the latter. I, I've always admitted I'm not very good at plot, and I usually try to find other things to kind of substitute for that. But um, that passage came out of the, riding the train, I guess probably from Rome to Naples. And I, I was just struck by all the empty and beautiful countryside on the way. Then you get to the city and it, everything's all packed in. And, and I thought, well, this is probably the same everywhere, Canada, anywhere, but, but it, was, it was kind of puzzling. And, and when I come to big cities, I, I live in Fredericton and I was joke, I've become a bit of a hick living here, but I think my brain is used to smaller, you know, I can just kind of, walk and you know if you drive in Frederick for five or ten minutes you're out of town and so I'm, I yeah. get kind of used to that and when I first got here I thought it was small but I now I really quite like that and so when I go to big cities I have a good time I enjoy it but I also think we're not meant to be stacked up like that on top of each other I just don't think it's healthy and so there was that just from that observation but I, I think um, it probably was building that passage bit by bit. I tend to just start with a fragment, maybe even just an image, a sound. And, and, and I do, if I'm looking for modifiers, I'll pick one that has the right sound rather than one that might not match. And, and you know, it's, it's not hard. It's kind of fun. Like I, I, I enjoy that tinkering with the manuscript and, and I have to have a printout. Like I, I have to have a page and I, I'll often go for a beer somewhere and just work on it and mark it up and and uh, I find late at night too I get ideas that I wouldn't get earlier I know some writers they like to steal you know some time at dawn and I I can't even function like I I'll just read a paper and drink tea until about noon that's about all I can manage um, but I think every writer's got to find what works for them but I do tend to work bit by bit and I 
I always collapse. And I, I was talking about this on Thursday in my class that um, then you don't have a blank page. Like if you're always collecting, you, you don't have a blank page. It's just that how can I feed in the, the line about rats in somewhere? Um, I was just actually working on a, a very small passage to do with my, my father because he, he went to Sri Lanka during World War II. It was Ceylon then. And I never asked him about it. And, you know, and I was thinking, well, now it's too late. And uh, you get curious and it's too late. But mm -hmm. I've, I've got a piece um, that I've been working on set in Mumbai. And I was thinking, well, maybe I can squeeze this thing in because when I was in Mumbai, I thought maybe my father stopped by here. And so I don't know, you know, I started that bit thinking about my father and I didn't know where it was going to go. And now I think, oh, maybe I'll find a home for it. And I kind of enjoy that. But I mean, once in a while, you get a story that flows really quickly, but I, I tend to build them just bit by bit, bit by bit. And, and yeah. sometimes it doesn't work. I, I always compare it to throwing stuff at the wall. I just see what sticks and then try to go mm -hmm. with it. And, you know, there's, it's not a science. I just feel like, well, it's either working or not. And, and I love moving bits around so that I'll think, hey, can that rat in the stairwell go here or can it go here or can it go here? And then I just get a feeling, ah, I like it there. And, and sometimes it's even where it doesn't seem to belong. Mm. I, I had a friend when I was at Iowa and I used to ask him, would it be weird if I put this part here? And he'd go, oh, yeah, yeah. And then he'd see in the workshop that I had put it there. And he, he realized I was using him to get the normal reaction. And I wanted to not do the normal one, which, you know, can be a dead end. But it was it was something to learn as a younger writer that, you know, yes, these can go here or there and it can make a difference where it is. And Yeah. So you mentioned bits. Um, are, are you the sort of writer that that then does carry a notebook with you and a pen and, and, and actually jot things down pretty much instantaneously or as soon as possible after you've made a certain observation or a certain thing has come to you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, my memory is not that good. So I, I have to, like I, I go to the dollar store, I get booklets like that or I don't even know if I've got any, but I, I get exam booklets. Yeah, there's a good one. There's something about Trump. Probably can't see it, but that's just <laughs> torn from an exam booklet. And yeah. when I travel, I can fold them up, put them in my pocket. And I, I was saying on Thursday uh, to not, don't get a you know beautiful moleskin diary because then you're intimidated. And you know the first line's got to be something poetic. And so I just think any anything to collect. I, I always keep a piece of paper in my pocket, folded up, and a pen and. I, I have to collect, but I, you know, and as I said, I don't always know where it's going to go, but I think, you know, a guitarist might fool around on a guitar at home and it doesn't, doesn't mean, oh, this has to go on an album or this has got to be part of your career. I, I think it's just, it's practice. It's developing your eye and ear. And you know, I, I think I'm kind of obsessive a bit with it. And when I, you know, when I see other people not writing, I'm thinking what, what's going on? How come they're not? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I had to move recently and I couldn't believe how many boxes of journals I had like there were just tons and I thought there's something almost sick here like I collected so much stuff um so it, I mean you you've been at work now for uh, close to 40 years I would think I mean dancing nightly in the tavern was was it 84 yeah I think so yeah yeah and I mean Upon revisiting, you know, your, your work in preparation for today, I, I was amazed by the fact that you are identifiably Mark Anthony Jarman, as we know you now in Czech techno, pretty much out of the gate. Uh, whereas, you know, a lot of writers, um, the style will go through, I mean, of course, mo all writers pretty much have a recognizable style or a recognizable voice, and it'll go through modulations. Yours certainly has gone through modulations. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference, for instance, between, say, the style of something like your travelogue, Ireland's Eye, and then the style that you put to work in some of your stories. Nevertheless, it, it just seems to me like you, you came out of Iowa, um, you know, pretty much in, in possession of, of your voice as a writer. Would you say that's that's accurate? Well, I, I guess I don't really even think about that. You know, I, I'm glad if there's a kind of a voice. Um, and despite your beautiful words at the beginning of this, I kind of fly under the radar. I'm not very well known, but I sometimes think that's almost better for a writer. 
but maybe that's a rationalization. Um, mm. But I, I think I've changed a little bit in that um, my earlier stories were third person, be like, Hank goes to the bar, Hank does this. Mm. And then I wrote a, and entered a, I entered a monologue competition. It was first person. And I just kind of liked that. And I, I kind of stuck with that. And, uh, and also at Iowa, I mean, I, I also went to the University of Victoria and that was, I had some really good teachers there. Um, but at Iowa, I wrote a story, you mentioned Cowboys Incorporated. And I, I think that that was kind of pivotal in that I had a whole collection, like almost like a shoebox and napkins and matchbooks. And I'd, I'd been driving a lot from Edmonton, West Coast, Victoria, Vancouver, Edmonton, Iowa, like just kind of, you know, not, I guess, a big triangle, but just different permutations of that. And I, I wanted to do kind of a road piece. I just knew, I knew I wanted to do that. So that was, that was the first time where I think I really just had all these fragments. And I think before it was more like, you know, A to B, this is going to happen in this story. And that one, I just kind of threw stuff in and I, I got a really rough draft. And then I thought, I don't want to make it too smooth. Whereas before I'd always tried to make the stories flow smoother. Mm. So I think that was, that was a change, but you know, I think that, I, I think also just reading John Cheever opened me up more because before I'd been reading tougher, right? Like, you know, Charles Bukowski, Hubert Selby. And, and I, I really liked Kerouac. I think just that flow, and, mm. uh, you know, he's not everyone's favorite person right now, but I, I found him a really great influence. And, mm -hmm. um, and then, but I went read Cheever, and I just thought, ah, I really like what he's doing. And it's a complete, you know, he's writing about suburbs and nice leafy trees. Mm. And I just thought, okay, there's there's a lot of possibilities here. And and then more recently, I've just been writing a lot of travel pieces. Is um, I wasn't really a jet setter, but around 2016, I got invites to uh, Shanghai, Mumbai, um, different places in Europe, the Balkans, and. So I started writing, writing more travel pieces. And my next book will actually be travel pieces. Yeah, I was going to say, and certainly I want to come back to music. So, and and I'll I'll be sure to do that. But um, I, I would say that yeah, since at least Ireland's Eye, and then certainly with Knife Party and the Hotel Europa, travel, or maybe I should put it this way, the experience of dislocation in some ways has, has become as important as, as music and musicians are to your writing. And, and personally, as someone who lived in Italy for a year, I've noticed the extent to which you keep going back to Italy in your imagination, as it were. And I'm wondering if you could maybe just tell us briefly what it is about the place, well, what took you there in the first place, and then, and then what keeps taking you back? Um. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I'd never been to Italy. Does it sound okay? No. Yeah. It's all right. Um, um, I, I got asked to teach a summer course there for UNB in Fredericton, and uh, so I jumped at the chance. And uh, um, I would have, I would have, you know, done it even if I had to pay a bit. I think, but um, that was my first time there, and I just found it was a good reason to make me go there. I don't think I would have booked that flight on my own, and uh, then I just. I loved Italy and uh, I was really struck by it. And I, I'd been actually working on a Wild West novel with Custer and Louis Riel. And, and uh, I put that on the back burner and I just thought, I'm going to write a slim, sunny novel about Italy and it'll be a bestseller. And I'll, it'll have Italy in the title, you know? <laughs> and then um, that didn't work out. And uh, the, the novel that didn't seem to work, I just started pulling sections out and working on them as separate short stories. And then I sold it as a collection which is the opposite, you know, usually the marketplace prefers a novel, a longer book and not a short story collection. But in this case, I went, I tried to please the marketplace and it didn't really work. I think my brain is just geared to short stories. And, uh, but I think it really made each section better because I had to work on them separately, make them kind of stand up, but they were all the same characters, the same setting. And, and then I tried to put them together. So there was a bit of a beginning, a bit of an ending, even the kind of cinematic pull away from Italy in a plane. And, um, so, and some, some reviewers compared it to, uh, to a novel, but, um, but that's really how it came out of. It was kind of just trying to do one thing and then finding, I had to go a different direction and eventually got a book. And, um, recently, uh, 
uh, it has to be said that you were also, you happened to be in Italy uh, when COVID hit. Yeah. And uh, that's not something many people can say. And so again, I'm, I promise we're gonna get back to music in a moment, but we're in Italy after all, where the language itself happens to be musical. So uh, maybe we're not uh, too off base here, but what was that like for you? And, and um, how did you get through it? Oh, it? It was really good, I have to say. Like at first, you know, COVID was in the news and we, we were living there all of February and got back to Fredericton probably about March 8th or so when everything really started to shut down. But but we really were kind of naive, so we didn't know what was happening. And, um, you know, originally it was China. And I, I think Brexit was way bigger in the news there than COVID. It was just seen as a foreign story at first. Then Northern Italy, though, actually became the real focus. And so that was a little scarier. Um, but, you know, I didn't know of any cases actually in Venice, you know, which is a separate island in a way. And, um, you know, the, the good thing though, is that everyone else fled. Like there were tons of drunken tourists there for carnival and they're really irritating. And I, I can see why the locals hate us, like hate the tourists coming in. Um, but I got to see it with all those people gone and I got to see, oh yeah, there's some locals there, some locals there. And this is, this is what it would be like without, you know, these crowds of drunks coming through all the time. Um, and, you know, we got to see places with no one around. Like uh, the, the piece that I wrote, uh, it's in Queens Quarterly in Kingston. Um, there's a picture at the beginning of the Rialto Bridge, just empty. And, you know, days before that photo, there'd been people with selfie sticks. You know, you just could not walk over that bridge without, you know, just pushing people away. And then suddenly, have it empty and and uh, I've got an image in that piece of of all the tourists with their luggage on you know the wheeled suitcases behind them and it's like an army leaving Stalingrad or something retreating toward they have to go to these boats on the lagoon to get to the airport but there was just lines of people fleeing and so you know we were thinking well should we be getting out of here and and we registered with the Canadian government thinking well they'll let us know if we should really get out and so we we just stayed until um beginning of March and and then we had to go through Trieste and Ljubljana and Zagreb and get to Vienna because I had a, a flight out of Vienna rather than Venice. And, but everywhere we went, they were saying like zero cases, zero cases. The cafes were full. Like it was almost like, well, it was just over at the mountain range, but it's not here. We're okay. And then, then only like a week or two later and borders kept closing as we were moving to those places to get to Vienna. So it was a bit unnerving but it was also fascinating i feel like i was really lucky in a way just and then i tried to sell the piece to the globe to walrus to different places thinking this is you know i want to do this right away this is really you know of the moment and uh, i just got nowhere and so um um i've got kind of a long-standing relationship with the uh, queen's quarterly and i sent it to them and then they they run photos they used my photos and uh, my partner Chris at hurley's did the rialto one and so I really like, I don't know. And I, I don't know, you know, more people would see it in Walrus, but I don't know, I, I was really happy with, uh, with what they did and that they did. It'll be in my next book, my next book. Super, I, well, Queen's Quarterly is an august publication indeed. So um, I'm, I, you know, I'm glad that you published it there. Um, as you were talking too, it just sort of reminded me of Joseph Brodsky. I've always had an image of him somehow walking around Venice alone, as, although that's completely impossible. But his book, <laughs> Watermark, often gives that sense of, you know, um, this ghostly figure just sort of traversing traversing the little streets uh, by himself. I had, I had his book when I was in Venice. And I went to see his grave over the cemetery island, and, mm. island and I got to know... Uh, I got to know uh, a waiter who's also an archaeologist and and i gave him that book so i don't have it anymore but it went it went to a good home it's in good hands okay let's come back to music um and to czech techno um a couple of the narrators in in czech techno play play bass in bands one of them plays bass and keyboards uh in that in that very affecting first story and certainly they are they are far from the only musicians, whether professional, amateur, aspiring or not, in your body of work. And so I just wanted to ask you, do you happen to play bass or keyboards or any instrument in a band, or did you ever at any time? Well, I'm pretty amateur. Pretty amateur. 
but uh, I, I have played bass. I own a bass, but I always needed the guitarist to kind of tell me. And I, I can't play chords. I've got a guitar, but I'm terrible with chords. Whereas bass, I could just you know do one note, and I could remember and you know had, you know some sense of rhythm and the tempo. And um, but I, I I then started playing harmonica a lot more, and I, I played harmonica in a blues band in Fredericton for a few years, and. Uh, and it's, you know, like amplified with a, a mic. It's kind of fun. Um, and I was just playing at an open mic Thursday night playing harmonica with a really good guitarist and piano player. And so it's kind of fun, but I, it's always been amateur. I had a garage band way back in Victoria, but again, yeah, I was, I was the bass player and the guitarists were all better than me. Uh, I've got two brothers that were really good guitarists. So it's kind of frustrating that I didn't seem to get it or I was too lazy to put in the time maybe. And I had I had a drum kit I had to sell when I moved because I just don't have room for it anymore. So I've, I've always loved music. It's always kind of in my head. But you know, there's other things too. Like when I was in Vienna, I went to see Bruegel paintings in the big art gallery there. It's kind of, you know, the old palace. And and I, I could spend an hour in that room just looking at those Bruegel. So, and I like food, I like beer. So, you know, music's one of many things, I guess, but but yeah, it's definitely there. It's funny too, you mentioned jazz because I, I'm actually not a giant fan of jazz, but but I think the fact that there's improvising and you know that it's not set, but I, I think I actually prefer a Ramon song with two or three chords repeated over and over to bebop that just goes on for ages. Um, and I, you know, I'll probably be making some friends of mine mad who are really good jazz musicians, but but uh, I just got really tired of those sax solos. I was just like, oh, I, I think I need a pattern. I think I actually need some kind of form. So, so you mentioned you've got a couple of brothers who are guitar players. Was music a big part of your family when you know when you were a boy? Because honestly, I when I think about your stories. Um, it, there are probably fewer stories in your body of work that don't mention music in some way or don't feature a musician than there are stories that you know that do so it it seems it's though as though it's been a big part of your life and i'm just wondering if if it was if if you had a musical household well i, I was really lucky and it, my parents read, so there were always magazines. They weren't always the best books and things, but there was always newspapers, Reader's Digest, that was read. So I was really lucky that way. I had really good English teachers, but my, I had older brothers who had really good records hanging around. So, you know, I was in, you know, junior high, grade six, and there's a copy of Blonde on Blonde in the house and Big Brother in the Holding Company. And also I grew up in Edmonton and CKUA was a really, really good radio station there. And so... After school, there was a show I'd listen to every day. And Saturday, I think around lunchtime, there was a blues show with Holger Peterson, and I religiously listened to that. So, you know, we didn't have a piano, but you know, yeah, my my brothers had a couple of guitars hanging around, and there was harmonicas that I would kind of grab and see if I could play, which I really couldn't at first. And um, so, yeah, I was I was lucky because I know some people that are if they're an only child, they you know, don't get that around there. They're listening to bubblegum music and they don't know that there's anything better around. So, so I, was, I was pretty lucky, I think, that way. Um, are you uh, a, a turntable sort of guy or a playlist guy, or are you a mixture of both? Well, <laughs> I've been through all of them, I think, but uh, I, I do have a turntable. I got a bunch of vinyl that I had to move when I, I left my larger house for a smaller place, and I'm debating what to do with it. Um, but when we moved to this new apartment, um, I, it was empty and I just brought over a little boom box that played cassettes and I set that up and it was actually really fun. I, I was saying to Clarissa, when we, uh, when we fill up this place with furniture, let's get another apartment that's empty. We'll just go hang out there. Obviously, you know, can't really afford to do that, but I love the idea, but I just stuck with, I've got this little boom box plays cassettes and that's now all I listen to. And I, I found it got mixtapes from decades ago and and they've stood up, you know, like the, the store-bought cassettes were not very good, but the, the ones you made your own were kind of better quality. And so I'm really having fun. I'm just going to, and some of them are probably from CKUA, some are from 
college radio in Calgary, Seattle, Victoria. Um, so I'm having fun with this pile of old cassettes and this boom box. And I've always been really low tech. Like my turntable I bought as a student in the seventies, I've got the exact same one. It's just a Yamaha, really simple. And not even, it doesn't even take it off the, I have to take it off the, the record, but, but yeah, I like them all. And I, I, I sometimes would play music with bad students and they'd come over and they were really got a kick out of the vinyl. I don't know why, but it's, they, they really enjoyed seeing the vinyl and hearing playing it and something, something good about it and good about it. If, if I had to describe your musical taste based upon a reading of your stories, I would have to resort to the cop-out term uh, eclectic because you mentioned such a, a dizzying array of musicians and bands, whether it's Captain Beefheart or uh, Johnny Cash or, uh, for that matter, Czech techno and Tunisian techno, about which I know very little. And I, I mean to ask you about that in a moment, but for now, I hope you'll indulge me and uh, and play a, a brief version of Desert Island Discs here. Um, what are your top five Desert Island albums, assuming, of course, that you can actually play an album on a desert island, uh, and why, along with your top five musical reads and why? I don't know. I don't know. I, I do like a lot of stuff, so I don't know if I could put it down to five. Um... And then it changes too, you know, because when I was younger, I thought, okay, you know, Highway 61 and Blonde on Blonde are amazing. But then later I got to really appreciate John Wesley Harding, which is way quieter. Um, I have one album that I guess this could go on the list. It's uh, always been above my turntable ever since high school, every single room that the turntable's been in. And it's, um, it's a band that everyone knows, but it's, it's Fleetwood Mac before Stevie Nicks, before Lindsey Buckingham. And it was Peter Green, who I think was a genius. And, uh, and his first couple albums with Fleet Mac, they're just kind of straight ahead blues, you know, British guys playing blues. But, but then around this one then play on, that's just got amazing stuff, you know, just all sorts of different sounds. And he, he hooked up with a second guitarist, Danny Kerwin, who actually Bill Gaston just sent me an email. Bill Gaston likes Captain Beefheart, but he sent me an email with the name Danny Kerwin in it. I was thrilled. Like I was thinking, I, I don't know anyone else who even knows that name. So, so then play on, it's got a great cover. It looks almost Persian, someone on a horse. And um, I'd have to have that just because it's followed me around since high school. And I always had it in a special spot. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I'm a big fan of, Graham Parsons, the Flying Burrito Brothers, Emmy Lou Harris, and um, I don't know. It's, I, I just can't. I blank out. Like I, I've really kind of come to appreciate Johnny Cash more over the years because I, I always liked him, but he was just kind of there. It's kind of like you know, a piece of furniture. It's just there. But I've really kind of gotten to like him more. And but I also like Roseanne Cash. I don't know. I think I'm not giving you a very good answer. Um, I was listening to one of my cassettes and there's a song by the Handsome family. And I don't know if anyone knows the Handsome family, but I wrote a piece about a skateboarder falling off the bridge in, uh, in Fredericton. And I, I used a line from it. It's um, anything to be weightless again. And, and then unfortunately, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Richard Vaughn, Aaron Vaughn was our writer in residence at UNB. And then he jumped off the bridge flat about a year ago and she's pretty well a year now and so I was I wrote a piece about that and I was thinking of you know putting the handsome family line in there again but that's you know not a band that I've stuck with it's just someone I really liked at a certain point and um there's a band out of Nashville called Lamb Chops on the same cassette I really like them I used to really like Vic Chestnut but I, I, I tend to, I don't know I think I'm not loyal I tend to you know like I bought the first U2 album and I thought, oh, I really like this. And I thought, I actually thought Echo and the Bunnymen would do far better than U2. I bought them both at the same time. But then I hit the point, like, you know, I'd hear another album or two and I thought, I kind of know what they're doing. I don't really need any more by those. So, so I don't think I have, you know, a, a list. I'll, I'll, I'll think about some tonight and it'll haunt me. I'll think, you know, why didn't I mention that? Oh, I have to say Helen Wolf. I, I, I love blues singer Helen Wolf. And I, um, little Walter's great harmonica player that was an influence on me and I 
as a kid, you know, I'd pick up a harmonica and be like, whee, whee, and then you'd listen to little Walter and he's playing stuff and just, he was like the Jimi Hendrix of, of harmonica players. And I thought, how is he doing that? And then, you know, about 80 years later, I can get a couple of the sounds that, that he's getting, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think of anyone. Anyone I've mentioned that you remember that in the stories? A check no, I, I, mean, I, I only like the sound of it. You know, I don't know very okay. much about techno, but it's like the nice rhyme and a knife party at the Hotel Europa. There's actually a band called Knife Party. And, but there's also literally a party where someone gets knifed. And so I like something like that, where some people are going to get one part of it. Some people are going to get another part. And, you know, Updike talks about an ideal reader and you just kind of hope there's someone out there who gets your jokes, gets your allusions to bands and lyrics. And, you know, no. There's there's probably a, a a master's or PhD dissertation to be done on developing a database of the of the music and the musicians and the songs that appear in the stories of Mark Anthony Jarman. But anyway, for now, let's go back to the to the to the music of writing. Who who aside from Kerouac, whom you mentioned earlier. Who were the writers, you know, who really keyed you into the music of prose? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, my mother's Irish, so I, to me, James Joyce is kind of sitting on my shoulder. Um, and she she lived about three doors down, two doors down from where the story of the dead takes place on Usher's Island. She, I think, was 11 Usher's Island. I think the story takes place 15 Usher's Island, these big old houses overlooking the River Liffey. And... Uh, so there's a number of Irish writers I probably like. Um, Americans have been giant influence. I mean, they're Canadians too. I remember reading Robert Croach, and I think it was the Stud Horseman, and it mentioned Edmonton and the legislative building. And I was thinking, I know that. I didn't know you could write about that. I thought you had to write about cocktail parties in New York. Like I, I found that was a real eye opener just to see someone writing about an area that I knew. So that was really important. Um, on Dachi's uh, Coming to Slaughter. I, he's almost like you too. I haven't kept up with all of his books, but but Coming to Slaughter, I really like. And I know a lot of writers have, have made that same same claim. And uh, um, Flannery O'Connor, when I was at UVic, my teacher, Bill Valgerson, got me to read Flannery O'Connor. And that was so good. I, could, I don't know, there's just something funny about her. It's serious, but there's really funny stuff. And I like that because because there's times I'll be writing at two in the morning and thinking, can I put this in? That's kind of ridiculous. And I say, ah, put it in, you know, and I, you know, I get kind of a kick out of it. Like, you know, I think writing is work, but it should be enjoyable. It should be fun as well. Like there, there should be a side of that. That's, you know, you get something out of it. Um, and, you know, I think Richard Ford's talked about if you're not writing, well, just go watch a football game or something. You don't have to always be writing. And um, Cormac McCarthy was huge. I think it was Leon Rook got me to read Blood Meridian a long, long time ago, and I couldn't believe it was the goriest book I'd ever read, but the language was amazing. And so, yeah, I kind of like writers that, that work on their language, and I, I guess I'm always surprised when writers don't. You know, I think, well, you can, you can write kind of ordinary or dull, or you can fool around with it more. And so, I don't know, but maybe I'd be more commercially successful if I didn't write that way, but I just think I have to write the way I write. I, you know, whenever I try to do something for the marketplace, I think, I think I'd rather fail doing what I want to do. You know, and you don't want to be indulgent. You got to think about the reader. You got to think about the world out there. But, but uh, you know, I've known some people who tried to go for something more commercial and then it didn't work. And I thought, okay, they just wasted a year or two on something. And I'd rather, as I said, I'd, I'd rather fail just working away at what I like doing. Um, all I can say to that is amen. Um, I was wondering, actually, I joked with Ara when, when I happened to run into her on the street, um, which is easy to do here in Kingston. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and, and I said, I, you know, Ara, I really want to ask Mark Anthony Jarman if, if someone commissioned you, like for some reason, a corporation like Absolute Vodka or something and said, okay, Mark, we want a, a well-made story. You can open in medias res, but, you know, we want a plot-driven, character-driven, well-structured, beginning, middle, and end kind of story. Um, and we'll offer you a pile of money. Um, would you do it? Could you do it? Or do you think that, for lack of a better word, your diamond, you know, your particular proclivity, your style, your voice would, would, would just have to come through and you'd have to tell 
absolute vodka, you know, take it or leave it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be a, that would be a, a tough one because uh, oh, I was thinking about something about vodka, but no, I've, I've lost it. But I, I just don't know if I could do that. That you know, I, the way I write just doesn't seem to to work out. Sorry, I just I had something and I lost it. Um, just trying if there's something oh i know i know sorry it's not that great but but an agent said to me once you know i you know i wish you were just a little bit more commercial and and i just thought well i don't have some thermostat on my arm that i turn commercial less commercial like you know if i could sell records like michael jackson did i i wouldn't complain you know but i think i'm just kind of stuck with what i do and uh, and it's not the worst rut to be in you know it's kind of it's kind of fun and I always tell my students who are you know much younger and I say like I'm I'm here from your future to tell you that you might still have fun when you're 66 or something you know that you can travel you can do things and and because there's always that feeling like oh, I got to travel before I'm 21 or it'll never happen and I think you can do both you know you don't have to you know, or if you didn't do it earlier you can do it later so I always I'm sure they wonder what the hell I'm talking about but <laughs> But I like to say, you know, I, I'm here to tell you, you know, your future could be could be fine. But especially these days, I mean, I find my students are very anxious, like they, they worry a lot. So you've mentioned your students a few times, and 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 as somebody who learned a lot, you know, at at the feet of of elder and superior writers who were willing to teach me, you've also mentioned your own teachers, both at UVic and at and at Iowa. Um, I'm wondering how it is now you, you go on about, say, passing the flame, as it were. I mean, how, what is it you, you do for your students uh, at UNB by way of introducing them to the musical qualities of language? I, I don't know if I have that much influence. Um, I think, you know, I mean, I get along really well with the students, but I, I never even thought about any kind of role. I remember... Um, I think it was, you know, Lorna Crozier, someone who was talking about, you know, being a mentor. And I just thought, I never even thought about that. It sounds to me like almost, are you like Mother Teresa? And I, it just hadn't crossed my mind that I had to be a mentor or do anything. I just think, well, I'll just, I can add it, you know, they, they hand in stuff at a workshop, I can work it over. And um, so I, I guess, I guess I don't really think about those or, or passing any kind of torch. I don't, but you know, I, I bring in books all the time. So, you know, if someone's writing, you know, something like, you know, like auto fiction or something, I'll say, okay, here's a couple more books you might want to look at and um, uh, magazines, lit mags. And so I don't know, I, I just try to bring stuff in and I, you know, um, just, you know, even news, newsletters and emails from, I get tons from lit mags all over the world because you send stuff out, then they always are sending you newsletters and contests and so I tried to just show them, especially like with the undergrad level, they have no idea. And I didn't, you know, I, until I went to UVic, I'd never heard of a lit mag or anything. And you know, Bill Valgertson said, go to the library and read lit mags. And so I did, I don't know if anyone else did, but I did. And then I actually saw the fiddlehead was one of the ones I looked at. And I was in Victoria and I thought, this looks like they might take something of mine. And they, they took my first, I think three poems and first couple stories then they started rejecting me when I thought I got better, which was really puzzling. And I had no idea that, you know, I would later end up in Fredericton and working, you know, as an editor on the fiddlehead. I had no idea at all. It was, it was just completely coincidence. One of the great aesthetic ironies of, of, of your creative life. Mark, I want to I wanna throw it over to some of our audience members right now. Oh, sure. Um, and I'm very pleasantly surprised indeed to... Well, I don't suppose actually I'm surprised, but it's, it's pleasant nonetheless to see this name in, in the list of questioners, Brian Bartlett. I assume that he's, um, he's writing from Halifax. Mark, he says, it's well known that one of your influences is song lyrics from indie pop, blues, rock and roll, etc. Do you actively read or even study song lyrics, or is the influence only from the osmosis of listening? I, I'm definitely a lyric reader. I always, you know, when I was in grade eight going home, from downtown on the bus looking at the album I bought, I was reading the lyrics. And I know I know some you know good people, even musicians who never even hear the words, but but I, I definitely I definitely pay attention to lyrics. And I think it was an influence on me. Uh, um, it was uh, Danny O'Keefe 
had an album Breezy Stories and uh, I was listening to it again and it's from you know kind of around when I was in high school and I listened to it again and thought this this has really stood up this is really good and uh, and a lot of it was the lyrics and so I emailed them and I got this reply back thanks you know there wasn't much of a message but I, I was just saying this has stood up and you know I'm a writer you were an influence on me and basically just got this thanks but he is at least he's alive and sending that back so yeah I, I think and I there's sometimes I mishear lyrics and then I'll steal I'll steal what I thought they were saying and I I'm I'm a sponge like I think I mentioned that um, but you know I I take from T.S. Eliot I take from long distance commercials on the TV like I, I just you know collecting movies TV shows like you know whenever I'm watching a TV show or movie I'm always thinking how are they going to get out how are they going to get out of this so I I kind of like and I I always keep note paper with me when I'm watching TV because sometimes even with football like I don't know I, I know I've got some lines here I just kind of like pop culture but I think I've got the, yeah, the rookie fumbles on his own five and then there was the look like ah, I can't believe I used like holding his head and, and it's like okay you're probably not going to get out on the field next there's, there's just uh, football's got this whole language and so I I like collecting that stuff and I don't know where I'm going to use it but so anyway it's good to hear from Brian hello and I don't think I gave much of an answer but I think it's all tied up that you know what's what's in a football game what's on an album what's on a painting what's on a record and to me it's all part of the same stuff and an influence definitely and um and so were you one of the people who was totally okay with the fact that that um that bobby dylan won the won the nobel prize <laughs> i i was completely fine I, i've got better things to worry about but, but my friend ross lecky who who brian knows he was you know he was so upset he just thought it completely wrecked the nobel prize and i was thinking oh, it doesn't matter to me life goes on for me and and I, you know, I've always been a Dylan fan, but, you know, haven't kept up with everything. But I actually found moving, I found a CD of uh, self-portrait by Dylan, which is kind of was roundly dismissed as not very good. And I've been listening to it almost just to see, like, what was he trying to do? And, and then I read this thing where he said he just hated, he got to hate his fans. And he thought, OK, if, if what I'm doing is giving me these fans, I'm going to do something that's alienating them or completely different. So. I get kind of a kick out of that. I don't know. I, I think I'm a bit of a contrarian, so I, I kind of almost appreciated what he was trying to do. Uh, yeah, a friend of mine saw him in St. John's and said that for most of the night, he had his back to the audience, and the only words he spoke directly to the audience were one time, thank you, friends. That was about it. Thank you, friends. Um, but he enjoyed the music. There are not often are you the kind of writer who writes about writers? There are a couple of narrators I can think of in your work who, who also happen to be writers. And I noticed that one of them, um, and I can't remember the band, but he plays music while he writes. Will you actually listen to music as, as you compose or do you need the uh, monastic silence? No, no, I, I, like, I like music, I like sound, uh, and I, I go right at the bar. Like I, I just get into a trance when I'm working on something, but I, I know good writers who need silence, they need a white wall, you know, no distractions. And I don't know what it is. And I, I had to, I was forced to in a way because um, once I had kids and a full-time job, um, I always thought I'm gonna write, you know, sometime I'll go to Paris and write a novel or next summer I'll do a whole bunch of stuff or I'll finish my Wild West project down the road sometime. Then I realized it wasn't happening and uh, I had to just learn to, you know, use a couple minutes here and a couple minutes there. And it was a real shift, but, but it adds up. Like it really adds up. And so, I don't know, I think, I think I'm evidence of that. Like, uh, you know, even just the number of travel pieces I've written in the last maybe couple, two years maybe. And, and so I'll have a book out a year from now, fall mm -hmm. 2020, a book of all the travel pieces. Um, oh, you're publishing a collection of travel pieces in 2022? Yeah, a year from now, yeah, fall. And is that Biblioasis? Um, it's actually uh, Goose Lane. Oh, Biblioasis okay. is going to do my selected stories down the road, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure when because they have so much in the pipeline. And uh, and I'm not in a rush because I, I wouldn't mind waiting until there are live festivals and things like that. And, and then uh, Goose Lane did my book Knife Party and uh, they're going to do the collection. Of, and including the piece about, there's two about being in Venice during COVID. There's one about being in Vienna, um, there's, you know, 
Croatia, the Balkans, two or three, maybe three on Shanghai, which was, it's crazy because I actually didn't enjoy <laughs> Shanghai. I went there in July for a conference, a story conference, and it was boiling hot, crowded, but for some reason I got three different pieces out of it. So it's, it's one of those ironies and there's one on Mumbai. Oh, and then there's one that's um, about going out west back to Alberta for a, a funeral of a friend and that's kind of a travel piece. And then there's one about ending up in the local hospital here in the stroke ward. And I, I turned out I didn't have a stroke, but they thought I did. And uh, so I got to hang out in the stroke ward with my laptop and just collecting. And there were people in the bed next to me, two different people at different times. And they were both fascinating, like really good stories. One guy was almost dead, but he was still a good story. And the other guy had been um, put in a wheelchair after a high school party or dance and uh, and it was years later but but he told me the story and so uh, I had to argue with my editor that that's travel going into the hospital and coming out into the parking lot is the best trip you're ever going to make and, and and I also thought going to the stroke ward is more of a trip than drunks going to Venice for a weekend and you know coming in Ryanair get drunk fly back on Ryanair like that's not really even a trip but so so I think they're they're agreeing with me. From uh, from Burn Man on Texas Porch to Edmonton Man in Stroke Ward. That's um, yeah. you dodged a bullet. You dodged a bullet there, and I'm sure we're all happy to hear it. You know, you <laughs> mentioned um, you mentioned Goose Lane. Great um, great press, great literary press in Canada, and you've published with um, you know some wonderful literary presses in the country. So you will be publishing Biblioasis. They're always doing great stuff. You've published with uh, a Nancy. Um, uh, another fine press. And um, you mentioned Czech Techno earlier, and I'm, I'm really just curious as to how this whole project came about, because you really don't see, I mean, this is bound to become something like a collector's item in can lit, because as you mentioned, it's a bit like a graphic novel. The illustrations are amazing with the black and red motif. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's handsomely presented. And I'm just wondering how, how this came about between you and Anvil out in, uh, out in BC? Yeah, um, Brian at Anvil did my hockey novel years and years ago, Salvage King, yeah. And, um, and then he also runs Subtrain magazine and uh, I had published a lot over the years in Subtrain and I, he, I think he was a bit miffed that I left Anvil to go to Anansi, but he forgave me after a while and we, we kept in touch. And, and then he asked if I wanted to do, he wanted to do a series of, you know, small works. I, I can't remember the, he's got some name in there and mine's the first, but um, it originally was only going to be um, three stories, like a chapbook. And then we ended up adding another and adding another. And um, so it's still, you know, pretty slim volume, but uh, I, I really like what they did with it. And I was, I was happy to do it. So, um, that was basically it. We just kept in touch. He asked if I wanted to do a project like that. And I thought, yeah. And then I was really happy with, as I said, um, Chris's cover and those drawings. Yeah, because each each story, as I said, has got a separate illustration, including the Jack Russell dog. Um, I used to have a Jack Russell died not that long ago. So I really noticed the one running around in Pompeii and I just thought, God, how, how could it survive in that heat? And you know, his tongue was just like, you could hear the sound of the tongue like clicking. Mark, we've got time for one more question. I think people have heard enough from me. So this one will go to the audience for, uh, and it's from Jason Blake. And uh, he says, Mark, do you ever regret having included a song or a band or um, quotation from lyrics in a story? Um, I know that Jason's in Ljubljana in Slovenia or a bit, bit to the east of there. So hello to Jason. Uh, I, I can't think of any regrets. Um, I don't think there's, you know, and I was even saying this to a class the other day that the idea of separating art from the artist. So even if you realize that maybe Bob Dylan's a bit of an asshole, I can still separate, you know, his work from the person. And I hope people do that with me too. Um, but uh, I can't think of any regret. The only thing I can think of, and it's kind of petty, is that I've had arguments with presses over whether I needed to get permission for lyrics and I've had to change. So I think, you know, the, the song 
a horse with no name, I wanted to use that and I had to, I had to rewrite it so that I wasn't quoting the lyrics directly, but the reader could tell, you know, I could just say there's someone on the radio singing about a horse with no name, but I didn't have separate lyrics. And, and to me, that's ridiculous. Like, I really don't think Neil Young is going to sue me over a few words in my book and maybe I'd get, you know, some PR if he did. And so I, I think that's, you know, people worried about petty things that I don't think are worth it, but. Um, but no, I can't think of any song or lyric that maybe Jason has something in mind that I you know, put in something by Benito Mussolini. Um, well, one thing that I don't regret and uh, won't ever regret, Mark, is the opportunity for um, having having had the opportunity to speak with you today. So thanks again to Ara uh, and to everyone at Kingston Writers Fest for uh, bringing Mark to us here, even if only virtually all the way from Fredericton. And Mark, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in, in thinking that uh, we'd all love to see you here in person sometime soon. So until then, um, my sincere thanks to you and uh, stay well, you and your family. Yeah, you too. Thanks a lot. Thanks to everyone. My um, pleasure. Yeah. Uh, also, Jason says not at all, just not at all, just an honest question. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so I once again, I'd like to thank uh, Adrian and Mark for joining us this afternoon for this uh, wonderful conversation on on literature and music. Um, I'd like to congratulate Phoebe Wang, who won a copy of Czech Techno Stories of Music. <laughs> a reminder to visit our official bookseller novel idea for copies of um, Adrian and Mark's books um, or if you're joining us from outside of Kingston which seems to be a few people please consider supporting the authors um, at your local independent bookstore. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and supporting Kingston Writers Fest. Be sure to check out kingstonwritersfest.ca. We've got a couple more events and thanks to everyone else for joining us today. Thanks very much.